about 40 pages with 50 recommendations uh, that really challenge us to rethink the public realm and position downtown Raleigh as a more flexible, vibrant, and creative center to help the downtown recover from COVID and continue to grow. Um, Bill talked about the extensive public engagement uh, in this study, and it's clear that there is a lot of great information in the study. Staff received it last week. We've been evaluating the report, and we've had a couple meetings with Bill and some of his team to start talking about the recommendations and issues and clarifying um, some of, of the issues. Clearly, as we move forward, it's going to require continued partnership with DRA and engagement with downtown residents and businesses. So as I mentioned, city staff just uh, received this over the past week. We've started reviewing it. Uh, as uh, I discussed with Mr. Melton, he asked for this meeting if we could have initial discussion on the report, an update on what staff has been working on, some of the things we're already working on, some of the recommendations, but also some of the issues or considerations with the report. Um, so today we've broken out the report into the five areas that uh, the DR, uh, DRA study had, and we're going to have different staff members update the committee on kind of where we are and talk about some of those considerations. Um, it's clear that some of these recommendations we're already working on and can implement uh, soon. Others will take some time, and again, continuing to work with DRA and the team. So um, we're going to jump into the presentation. And first up, let me introduce Evan Raleigh. Uh, you all know Evan, our new assistant city manager, been with the city about two months. Uh, Evan is here today and is going to lead the presentation. And Evan, in July, will actually become a DRA board member. He will be uh, appointed as the city manager's uh, representative to the DRA board, so he'll be working closely on implementing this study and closely with Bill and the board. Uh, Evan will also, as part of the transition, uh, take my seat here and as the manager staff work with you all, the EDI committee, beginning at your committee meeting in August, to whether it's on this issue and continued discussion or on corner stores or other issues the committee may uh, assign. So with that, let me turn it over to Evan. Well, thank you very much, Assistant Manager Green, and uh, good afternoon, Chairman Melton, Mayor Baldwin, and members of the committee. Uh, it is a pleasure to uh, be joining you today and, and have the opportunity to be joining you in the future going forward. I uh, very much look forward to, uh, to working with this committee uh, in the future. So uh, we do have quite a bit of information to present to you today, and before we get into uh, the meet, uh, just kind of wanted to set the stage a bit. Uh, to, to, to plant some seeds in terms of some overarching things that you may want to be thinking about uh, as we begin this presentation. So um, the report, as you can see, uh, Mr. Green has a copy of it. It is quite thick. It is uh, a very well done study uh, that has uh, gotten public engagement from uh, many hundreds, I think more than a thousand participants. And, and there are a number of, a great many recommendations that are contained in that report. I think the number is more than 50. So uh, just uh, understanding that it's gonna, some of these, as, as Mr. Green alluded to, we've, we're, we're working uh, on in the moment, but there are others that are going to take uh, a bit more time for us to study and understand and prioritize. So just wanna be realistic about the time frame, timeline uh, in terms of our uh, we'll say investigation of some of these items. Um, you know, many of the, the recommendations are ones that will also come with it a, uh, you know, a resource question. Um, you know, whether that's human resources, financial resources, or otherwise, some of the recommendations you'll see will necessitate some type of change in policy. Uh, that will require additional council action if the committee wanted to see and council wanted to see them move forward. 
So uh, and kind of everything in between. So, again, understanding that um, there are uh, major implications uh, that would involve some time if, if uh, the, the direction is to take up some of the some of those recommendations. Uh, also, keep in mind that there there certainly are trade offs represented in um, in some of the recommendations. One I can think of uh, just as an example is uh, the private use of public spaces, which is something that's kind of come to the fore in this COVID era. Uh, there are recommendations that uh, would enhance that uh, in, to some extent, but I think it's also imperative that the committee and council keep in mind uh, what. Uh, you know, some of the potential ramifications of those um, implementing those types of recommendations, just really uh, making sure to keep a, a close eye to that. Uh, one thing that I, I will mention, and we as staff have already talked about this, is the need um, based on our, our early evaluation uh, of these recommendations just to form a working group that will uh, really dive into I'll call them some of the meatier, more complex recommendations that are put forward in the report. I'll return to that at the end, but um, just know that we are um, have already identified the need to, to move forward with a staff-led uh, effort that would also include uh, is it inter interdepartmental, also include representatives from DRA to um, help us uh, move through and, and work through some of the recommendations. And the, lastly, is really just an acknowledgement that um, even the report itself and the recommendation section notes that uh, some of these are uh, recommendations are longer term in nature, that they will take, uh, you know, um, potentially up to a year, potentially more for some of these to actually bring to bear. So um, there are definitely areas for quick wins and things that we can act on uh, immediately. And, and we intend to take, uh, you know, take those up. But also uh, we have to acknowledge that there are some that are definitely longer term uh, in nature. Next slide, next slide, please. So just to give you a quick sort of overview of how uh, we're going to uh, present this to you today, um, the report is broken out into five different sections. And so staff is going to be speaking to the recommendations that are contained in each of the five kind of topical areas, um, which is consistent with the way that the report was structured. Uh, and you will notice that uh, there are highlight highlighted each of the recommendations has a has a color beside it. And um, so what we've given you here is a legend uh, that will help you understand what those colors mean. The green uh, items are ones that staff is all basically on the ground underway or um, uh, something, you know, actually out there happening. Uh, the, the yellow items are ones that may not necessarily be implemented, but staff has done a considerable amount of work uh, to get ready to implement. Uh, in the final group are those that are color, uh, color coded in purple. Um, these are items that uh, do require further evaluation and study. And uh, again, largely our, our working group would be focusing on the items that you see colored uh, in purple. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, turn the presentation over to uh, our staff. Uh, Whitney from Special Events and Emergency Management is going to begin um, the first section of the report. Good afternoon. Um, once again, I'm Whitney Schoenfeld with Emergency Management Special Events, and then our newest functional area of our office is hospitality. Um, so we oversee all of the outdoor seating and private use of public spaces as well. So what we've done throughout this presentation when staff is presenting, we've taken the recommendation slides that Bill presented to you last week, and this is where Evan mentioned we've kind of color coded them. So just as a reminder, anything green, and we also have a legend at the top of each of these slides, but green is stuff that we are currently doing, yellow stuff we are working on, and pink slash purple is items that are longer term and that need further evaluation. Um, so happy to report on the outdoor dining recommendations that you'll see a great deal of these are in green, um, which we are already doing a lot of these. So then what we've done is we have consideration slides where we've pulled out the items that were in yellow or in pink. So again, these are the items that we are working on or these are the longer term items that we need further evaluation on. Um, so the main one on here is kind of numbers one and three. 
is building a clearer process to make the existing outdoor seating expansions permanent. Um, and I will remind everyone that we actually have a permanent process in place already. Um, it existed prior to COVID, but it was very minimally used. Um, so if you've seen Deco has a parklet and Virgil's has a parklet. Um, so those are really the only two that existed prior to COVID. Um, now, obviously, you've seen a lot more businesses are taking advantage of this expansion and expanding on the sidewalk, doing pedlets where we've moved the pedestrian flow of traffic into the road, building more parklets, which we're kind of working on changing the name of that, as alluded to last week as well, um, and doing some street closures in some cases too. So we continue to work with staff and other departments. Um, really, our office is taking ownership of it, and then we just kind of funnel the request through our various other departments to make sure that we have approval on certain items that they're the sub subject matter experts on. Um, we're also working with our planning um, folks about design standards and having illustrations so people can see that easier to understand what they need to do and also having like a listing of requirements as well. So for visual learners and just like a list as well. Um, as far as the recommended pilot program, I think our goal would be to actually implement this new process as soon as um, the October 31st deadline is over. So we don't necessarily see it as a two to three year pilot program. We would like to implement it even sooner than that. Um, and the main thing that goes along with that is that currently you see those orange and white barriers out there. Um, transportation actually rented those at no cost uh, to the applicants. Um, we know that they're not the most aesthetically pleasing, um, but it was something that we could provide for free and in the meantime. So that would be something that we would work with the businesses on and what those standards are to he'll still have something that's protective, but also aesthetically pleasing. Um, as far as the fee structure, so in the past, outdoor seating permits were always $317, which I have listed on here. I'm happy to report that all of you actually waived those fees this past fiscal year, as well as this next coming fiscal year. Um, there are going to have to be further conversations about what those fees look like moving forward um, because it does become complex when we're giving away the public right of way to a private business that is then turning a profit off of that private space. Can I say something about that for a moment? Yeah, I was thinking maybe we'll go, since this is broken up in sections, right, maybe we'll do questions. Or you can jump in now if you want, but I was thinking we'll open it up as soon as we're done with this part. This part really concerns me. We have to rethink how we think about parking in our parking. I'm, I'm just laying it out there. Um, from a revenue standpoint, we're not making the revenue that we are used to making, and that should not be our primary consideration. So that's all. And sorry, I couldn't help myself. That's okay. I pre ditto. And uh, we'll. We'll also, I think we'll do a little more dialogue when we get through this next slide or two. Sure. Um, so then the other key element is insurance requirements. Um, and I know Bill brought this up about do we need the extent of what we require right now? Um, and I think we are open to looking at that, but just to note that anything would need approval from risk management. Um, another comment that came up is a lot of the businesses have existing certificates of insurance. Um, it's just kind of changing some of the language on there. So it hasn't seemed to be too much of a problem from the businesses because they already have insurance in general. Um, and then probably the most exciting portion of this is a grant program. And I'll talk about this later with our small scale activations as well. But we are exploring options for um, businesses to apply for grant funding to build their own barriers and kind of um, further expand upon their parklets, sidewalk extensions, what and whatnot, through the American Rescue Funding. If it's OK, um, as we transition from outdoor dining then to curbside, could we do questions for outdoor yes. dining discussion and every section? Yes, Does that absolutely. work for you? OK. Um, I have one, but Councilmember Knight, do you have anything? You go ahead. Uh, I, not really a question, just maybe something to think about with uh, when we create standards for what the more permanent structures will look like. Um, one thing I heard when we were doing this temporary one, we were trying to make it really flexible for folks, and some people actually 
without having the menu of options got really frustrated by it because they're like, well, I don't know what to do because it's too flexible. And so I think there's probably a sweet spot between making sure folks can create the space that works for them, but then providing like a menu of options. I think it would be great if there were like things that the city could help, I don't know, through grants or through however we're going to do it, but we can say, here's three options, which one works for your space and we'll come out there and help you set it up. I think that would be really great for, for, you know, the private sector. Absolutely. So that was just one thing I thought of. And then it's on here, you know, temporary extensions are valid through October 31st, but this is one piece. I really don't want there to be a, a gap in this. So this is one thing that I would really like to see come back to us before the temporary extensions expire mm -hmm. so we can get this in place. So I, I put this like towards the top of my, my priority list. Sure. I do have a question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, um, the two to three year pilot program, would you go over what the rationale is why we would need a pilot program as opposed to just moving from temporary to permanent? Bill, do you want to allude on that? Because since it was a DRA recommendation. Yeah, obviously, you know, it would be preferable as a permanent program. The only idea there was if there was an opportunity here, you're, you're changing your standards, you're creating new safety and aesthetic standards. Um, and so if there was a need to potentially, so to speak, try it out, uh, then you would potentially have uh, a program like that. Pilot program might not be the best phrase for it. The other thing we heard from businesses was essentially a trade-off of, you know, we understand the need for standards, we're willing to invest, but we need a little bit of certainty that we're not gonna have this ripped out from us a few months from now. So that balance there, obviously the longer the, the permit would be valid, the more they're willing they're willing to go there's a balance there for you all as a city on how you want to you know assign your public space but that was some of what we heard was we'll invest more if we have some certainty of how long the program lasts and follow up um, for staff so the tra the permanent the traditional permitting process is that a yearly you re-up every year and you yes. got to pay your fee every yes, year yes it's an annual fee and annual renewal <clears throat> okay uh, to to mr king's point i would think when this comes to us at full council or to committee for recommendation or approval, um, I mean, I would support making it permanent. And then if we just need to look at evaluating it every so often to tweak, I want to make it easy for businesses. So if it will give the private sector confidence, if we say this is a permanent change, but we also want to make sure we're checking in periodically, not to go back, but to tweak if we have to, like, I think that might be helpful. And before I forget, I've meant to say this two times, the mayor has relocated issues over here. Council member branch is absent and excused. <laughs> That's what I mean. I was thinking a pilot program may give me as a business owner more pause than having it just yeah. you have to deal with it in the normal way of yearly, you know, re upping. So. Absolutely. Or maybe how you could think of it is this way um, one of the recommendations is to reduce the um, annual fee from 317. Mm -hmm. Maybe what you do is say it's permanent, but we're going to come do an inspection every like annually right. and you'll have an annual yeah. fee of I don't know $100 or sure. something like that I, I just threw a number out there yeah. you all figure that out but that would be one of my suggestions because pilot program does does not say permanency it says we're trying this out right. so um, let's go for permanency the other thing is the grant program is probably my number one priority um, as soon as we get rescue funds in I want to see that um, the mayor loves a pilot program, so if she is saying, let's not do this as a pilot and make it permanent, that's pretty clear direction, I think. God, I do love pilot programs. It's a way you can get things done. <laughs> but I do think from a policy standpoint, it sends a much stronger message if we mess if we make it clear we're going to keep it. So. Yes. Yeah. Anything else, y'all? Well, I didn't know if the mayor wanted to continue the conversation on parking. It does seem like that is a, for downtown is a bigger one than just this um, as we get into uh, paid parking and parking on the street versus parking on the garages, et cetera. But, um, I think we have like maybe, six more of these yeah, no, maybe topics. We'll do that we later. Maybe we'll okay. do that later. All right, you can move on to the next one now if you okay. want. Thank you. Um, so that's it for outdoor dining. So now I'm going to pass it over to Michael Moore to talk about curbside zones. And don't worry, I'll be back later to talk more about small-scale occupations. Good afternoon. Again, I'm Michael Moore. I'm Director of Transportation here in Raleigh. Uh, 
I'm fortunate, and then I have the briefest section to kind of go through today. So I'll, I'll move through it quickly. And I think you know that curbside pickup zones are something that we moved very quickly to get implemented. Uh, we kind of moved fast and uh, quickly and cheaply to kind of get these on the ground, and I think they've been pretty popular. And you uh, did a great job. Well, Matthew and Paul did a great job. Staff did a great job. Y'all did a All great job. All the kudos job. go to them. So. Um, so a few recommendations here again green is what we're currently doing the yellow things are the things that we're working on and uh, the magenta color is the things that are we're going to have to get into a little bit more deeply first was uh, talking about implementing a new application process we really look f that that sounds great because number one it helps us start to understand the needs on the curbside and how we balance that with all the other needs that are going on there that's something that we will get underway here pretty quickly uh, that application process helps us identify, again, um, opportunities for shared zones. We're already kind of, that's already in the works. We've got that going on right now. Um, third point was to do a more durable design. That is something that we've, we've struggled with a little bit, and you can see some, some pretty uh, visible and uh, effective illustrations that here to the side. A couple things that we just want to have, we have some considerations about that to kind of walk through. Um, the temporary deployment for the holidays, we'll work with DRA on how we do that. Uh, parking enforcement, we put that down as one that needs further evaluation because that is a resource uh, that we'd have to look at uh, finding. Uh, and then lastly, how do we allow for continual flexibility for that sort of pickup zone, recognizing that a retail establishment ha probably has a very different need than sort of a uh, um, a kind of a grab-and-go uh, restaurant business so we need to kind of think about how we do that and understanding that we'll take that approach uh, that one size does not fit all some considerations here again we've already started to look at some of how we might pilot longer-term signage if you've been down toward Parkside you've probably seen some of the stanchions that we've got in there that we've got kind of in, in as a trial what we would do with orange paint would be what we're trying to illustrate here in this picture um, trying to find again something that's sort of visual appealing visually appealing will grab your eye make it very clear to people that this is a pickup zone not a parking zone um, but we need to be careful about just the cost of implementation if these are permanent how often we're going to be out to have to maintain them and just a few other operational in, uh, impacts like can we get behind the bollards to make sure that we're doing street sweeping so um, that adding that, that that painted area is something we're going to look at to make sure that again we can detour hopefully if we've got something that's more visible and the it's delineated more clearly it might give us a, a, a kind of a help on how we're having to uh, enforce those zones it'll be more apparent to someone who's parking there that uh, they're not to park there that this is literally for kind of pick up and grab and go and then lastly we're already working with uh, dra on how we partner on this education process and that rollout to get everybody in for more permanent installation so that is something that is going to be an ongoing process for us um, and we've got great partners with DRA and we look forward to moving that along so with that I'm happy to take any questions Councilmember Knight do you have anything Mayor I'm good thank you um, I was just gonna add that I um, I, I like the idea of painting the curbside zones. I mean, they make them more visible. And I know, I think further in the presentation, we're going to be talking about the um, infrastructure and public space investments. And I almost think that there's a good way to partner those. Because, like, for whatever we're painting for curbside, I think that, I mean, that, that's almost sort of like an art activation. So some sort of partnership there might be helpful. I don't know. That's a very good point. We'll look into that. And... Um, the flexibility aspect is too uh, good too about how some folks may not want it year round, but the ability to do it like holiday time for certain places too. And obviously, those we probably wouldn't paint, but exactly. I want to request if some of your staff um, could get back to me to talk about street sweeping, I'd appreciate it. We can do that. Thanks. And thank you. So, thank you. And who am I turning I'm turning it back over to Whitney now? All right, so our next session, session or section, excuse me, is the small scale activations. Um, so once again, these are the four recommendations that the DRA outlined. Um, we've again highlighted, again, green, we're doing, yellow, we're working on magenta longer term items. And I did want to provide a bit of background on small scale activations. Um, in 2017, Council actually authorized an agreement with the DRA to program some of our downtown plazas during non-peak times. 
Um, so those are portions of City Plaza, Union Station Plaza, Market and Exchange Plazas. Um, we did all of those that do not require street closures. And again, it was to encourage people to utilize our downtown spaces and make downtown a vibrant, lively atmosphere. Um, as a part of that agreement, we actually waived fees for the DRA, um, and we also waived the 90-day application deadline. So this is kind of similar to what we want to do for other small-scale activations. It's kind of this model that we already have in place for the DRA. So now getting into their specific recommendations, um, the new application process. So again, several years ago, when our office was first created, they kind of had the idea of figuring out, do we do different tiers for special events? Do we do a one-size-fits-all approach? Um, and we kind of went with the one-size-fits-all approach. Now we recognize that that most likely needs to change, and we need to have different kind of tiers for large-scale special events and smaller-scale special events. Um, so we certainly think that it is feasible to do that now. Um, so we've kind of split it up into tier one and tier two. So those higher impact events are major thoroughfares that are closed, um, high attendance rates, alcohol, um, certain kind of event components that make it a higher impact event. You're impacting residents, businesses, things like that. Um, and then the tier two we have listed on here is our lower impact events, small scale events. So maybe a smaller attendance, a one block closure, um, not closing any roads, maybe they're using some of the same plazas that we are with the DRA, no alcohol, things like that. Um, the 30-day application deadline that the DRA had mentioned um, is also similar to an existing process we have with neighborhood block parties, but again, those are minimal impact too. So I think we can find a happy medium between what we currently do with neighborhood block parties and our traditional special events that we host. Um, once again, if we change any insurance requirements, we would again just want to make sure that we're getting approval from risk management. And similarly with those different tiers, we could also scale our various fees. So application fees, venue rental fees, parking encumbrance fees, permit things, things like that, we can all scale depending on the event that's coming in and whether they meet that tier one or tier two. Um, going off of this uh, for providing a training, uh, so our office actually already hosts special event community engagement meetings. Uh, prior to COVID, those were in person, and then during COVID, we made those virtual. So we can kind of use that similar platform where we're engaging with event organizers and offering a training for them on our special event permitting process. Um, we know it's very comprehensive. We know it can be intimidating to others. So that's why we want to take this opportunity to create a smaller scale guide and really train people that are interested in doing that. Um, and we could have those frequently. It just kind of depends on the interest from the community. Um, the other recommendations were pre-planned layout, pre layouts for certain spaces. Um, we do collect site maps from all event organizers. So we are happy to share that with event organizers that are interested in hosting an event. Um, we just we did want to give the disclaimer that every event is different. Um, they're all anchored to different buildings or different locations depending on what the event is. Uh, but we are happy to share those with people. Um, and the event infrastructure can also change depending on how someone wants to have an event. Um, the last piece here is the expense of security and barricades, which we know can be a deterrent to event organizers. Um, this is something that we highlighted in Magenta that would need further evaluation. Um, I will say that the cost of off-duty RPD, or if you're hiring Wake County Sheriff's Office or any kind of private security companies, those are set by those agencies. Um, it's not necessarily us. Um, and I think RPD is a larger conversation because they have off-duty working at other locations too, not just for special events. Um, so probably a larger conversation that needs to be had there. Um, as far as barricades, so the city does not actually provide barricades. And when I say barricades, I'm thinking of the orange and white reflective barriers that notify you the road is closed, you can't turn down that way. Um, we used to supply some event infrastructure from the convention center. Uh, but we realized that that wasn't always equitable depending on the event, um, so not all events got it. So we kind of put a stop to doing that. Um, what we do supply is meridian barriers, and those are the barriers that are used to prevent vehicle-borne dangers. So we put those out 
at nearly all events that close roads, and that is done at no cost to the event organizer. So it's staff time to get the barriers out there, to put them in place, they're used for a day, two days, however long it is, and that's all done at no cost. And with that, I will take any questions. Mayor. Um, so a couple of things. Um, Market and Exchange Plaza specifically, and this is probably more for Bill. Um, you know, I was on council at the time when we came to that agreement. What was the difficulty in um, activating those spaces? Yeah, that's a great question. And for those, uh, just to remember, Market and Exchange are the two plazas that run between Fayetteville Street and Wilmington and then 200 block either side of the Pointer YMCA. Uh, there were a couple of challenges. We did program them a lot. Uh, they're fairly narrow spaces. Um, they're a little funny where if you put an event there, you basically have two different footprints that are near each other, but they're actually not really seeing each other. So vendors on one side or the other feel a little disconnected. Uh, loading and unloading was a challenge uh, on those plazas as well on a busy Wilmington, that loading zone on Wilmington Street services all those restaurants. And, and also uh, loading and unloading was a challenge for vendors. Also, uh, we were not permitted to do alcohol in those plazas. And so when we did after work concerts, people you know, did cite that as a concern, um, just to be straightforward. So there were some challenges there. And if you think about it, given that we have Union Station Plaza, City Plaza, Moore Square, uh, the Performing Arts Plaza, there's a lot of similar spaces. Um, what that plaza has is a great location on Fayetteville Street. So you know, later in the study, we did suggest looking at that as um, taking you know, some of those art installations that you see, things like the umbrellas over the street, where you're not having to put it over a right of way, you're putting it over um, market and exchange and do something that is kind of more permanent installation that draws people in is worth coming to see but isn't necessarily the same as an event footprint i do think you could do some events on there smaller scale things but uh, it's certainly been a learning experience with those two plazas okay. which brings me to my second question which is something you mentioned um i was going to ask what is the rationale for no alcohol sales For small activations, you're talking under a thousand people. What is the rationale for that? Because I would, I was just thinking the same thing. If somebody wants to do an event, I mean, especially after work, that's part of the attraction is going out with your friends or whatnot. And so we traditionally haven't said no alcohol for smaller scale events because right now. We, we treat all events are the same, it's just an event. Um, so it's really up to the event organizers whether or not they have alcohol. Um, and that was just an idea for the separate tiers because alcohol does create more complex complexities. Um, typically that's a trigger for having to have Raleigh police on site, um, but we can certainly revisit that. And I know that not every event that has alcohol is truly a, a larger scale event. It could be smaller with alcohol too. So you're just meaning when we're looking at breaking into different tiers, sort of a menu, you would offer an option that's, if hey, if you know there's not going to be alcohol at this event, here's this menu option because you may get to go around some other requirements that will take more time. Yeah. Got yes. it. But it still would be an option for other folks who, would, who may want it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, those are my two. Let me see if there's a, do you have anything else? So, it, it, in general, it does seem that y'all are trying to become as more spontaneous or the ability to be spontaneous. I think in the post-COVID world, we need to be able to do that for our public spaces and the use of them. Um, and I think we could get there even quicker and better by putting more onus on DRA to help in that preparation and planning and leading on it because then if it goes awry it's on them um <laughs> so this is for the benefit of their businesses so i think the more we can push forward and allow you know allow and make it be known that um we can do things very quickly if need be in a safe orderly manner then i think that would be great for the public yes so i have a couple things i mentioned this when um mr king gave the initial presentation at our last council meeting um, I ran a couple of nonprofits and we would struggle with uh, events downtown just because we didn't have really the bandwidth to do the large scale stuff and there mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of options for us. And I think one thing that would be a big hindrance is, you know, the layout of your event. And so being able to, I guess, collect other people's work product, so mm -hmm. to speak, and create almost like a crowdsourced menu, I think that would be really great. Right. 
Um, the other question I have is why don't we provide the barricades? I know we do the, the vehicular safety ones, but the, the bigger ones, how come we don't offer those? I'm not sure we honestly have enough. So if we have like multiple scale, multiple events that are happening all at once throughout the city and especially like the downtown area, which can often happen, I don't think we necessarily have enough. And we also need to keep some on reserve if we have like an emergency situation yeah. elsewhere in the city where maybe there's flooding and we need to close a road or something with police. Um, so I just don't think that we currently have enough to supply at all events. Yeah, I don't know if this is the right phrase, but there's like the opportunity cost sort of like, I know they cost money, but if the trade-off then is more folks downtown um, eating at restaurants or shopping, um, it seems like they would more than pay for themselves. And to Councilmember Knight's point, um, I don't know that I use the word spontaneous because obviously we have to organize these events, but I, I get the idea of um, flexible and accessible. And I really think you know, a small nonprofit, for example, not going to own those barriers and probably may not have the means to find them or rent them. Mm -hmm. So if we were able to obtain more so that we can be helpful and say, we've got your event permitted, we went ahead and set everything up, or they're available to come pick up and return, I think that would be great. And I, so I think looking into how we can obtain them and then also make it to where groups can access our public spaces and help bring people down here would be great. Had one more thing kind of based on that um, you talked about in the past that you would provide bar barricades by Grax chairs and whatnot from the um, convention center mm -hmm. but it wasn't always equitable so you didn't do it anymore right can I flip that thinking to say um, we want to find a way to make it equitable so we can do it again okay yeah we can certainly have more conversation on that do do we have um, pr or provide a point person uh, that's that's on the job active on weekends um, that anybody could call um, on these type of issues? So our office, um, we're small, but we're mighty. Um, so there's currently <laughs> there's currently seven of us. Um, about three to four of us are dedicated to special events. So depending on the event that's happening, each one is assigned an event manager from our office. And then we are typically on site at those events too, um, at least for setup or when the event starts. Um, but we're also always available as a resource and too. And you can make decisions on the spot yes. over the weekend without having to talk to anybody else yes. in your staff? Okay, yeah. great, thanks. We may talk to each other quickly, right. but sure. yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and I didn't mention this, but the other idea for small scale activations is again to use that American Rescue funding um, to create a grants financial assistant program to help those nonprofits and special events too. And to get more of those barriers. Yes, and did. to get more class three barriers. Yes. All right. I think we're good with this topic. Okay. I will next pass it over to Pat Young. Good afternoon, committee members, Pat Young with Planning and Development, speaking about public space investments and infrastructure. Um, before you see the recommendations with our um, traditional color coding, before I get into those, I wanna quickly recognize Travis Crane and Danya Sandeep of our staff who are here today. Subject matter experts have had almost two decades worth of um, experience working on downtown activations and uh, uh, downtown uh, improvements to make our downtown more livable. Um, so, as you can see from the slide, there are a number of areas here um, where work is already underway uh, and being evaluated. <clears throat> but before I get into the considerations, I, I want to say a couple of big picture points. All of these items are, involve um, a combination of either public investments or um, coordination, usually both. And so, I want to emphasize what you heard um, Evan Raleigh talk about at the beginning about having a staff working group that works with DRA and other stakeholders to really um, quickly um, drill down on um, how, how these ideas would work uh, and how to develop them uh, to meet DRA's recommendations. Um, and, and also, a lot of these, again, are, are underway. I'll talk about this in a moment. But there's a um, lack of coordination and a coherent strategy is, is necessary. So the first recommendation is in investing in basic infrastructure to better facilitate small-scale activations. Um, working with our um, partners at the convention center, they've identified um, a need to um, replace the existing soundboard and lighting that we had kind of get a next generation lighting. 
make sure that's available kind of in a turnkey, easy, low cost for small activations. Um, the co that, that cost, as you heard from Council Member Melton, can be a real impediment to nonprofits and other small groups using um, downtown for their events. Um, the S, the r very roughly estimated cost on that's $160,000 just for the lighting and the soundboard. So um, if you add the shade structure, which was another priority based on DRA's um, feedback, that has not been scoped yet. So again, with this working group, we'll very quickly um, put together a scope uh, and alternatives and come back to you um, in the fall, as you'll hear more about from uh, um, Mr. Raleigh. Is, is this Go something ahead. stimulus funding can be used for? Well, so I'm glad you mentioned that. So I think any feedback you all want to give us, I think m most or all of this is eligible for the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, of course, there are a lot of competing priorities. So if, if you think there are specific areas here, based on my conversations with DRA, and Bill can speak for himself here in a moment, um, the lighting and the sound and the shade are, are absolutely priorities. They're, they're big impediments to activation of a lot of our downtown places, spaces. Um, but we are, um, as you see on the slide, we are, um, working a pilot project, um, that, that's, for, that's for the mayor, um, to um, use some of our um, facade grant money to work with parks and recreation to activate public spaces from the Chavis Dick Strollway. And I think that'll be a really good proof of concept um, for, for these types of investments. And we want to look at our existing um, grant programs like the bug grant and the facade grant and make some recommendations to you about how we can um, reform those to be more focused on placemaking. Um, secondly, is, is creating fund for covering basic costs of small scale excavations. As I just said, the working group I've alluded to will evaluate all the existing programs. There are a number, there's about half a dozen programs that are in this space, but the eligibility criteria have not been updated in many years, sometimes in decades. And so we'll really want to uh, get in with the stakeholders in, in detail and say, and our, of course our attorneys to make sure we can, um, technical and legal issues are resolved and that we can bring a recommendation to you about how to advance that one. Um, repositioning downtown public spaces for specific ap activations. Um, I think, again, as I alluded to at the outset, there are a number um, uh, of the, th the three places we see a lot of activations, Exchange and Market Plazas, Rust Plaza and City Plaza are all operated by different entities, right? So I think creating a venue for coordination and collaboration, um, essentially memorandums of agreement or other ways of getting understanding to make sure that there's a coordinated and coherent approach to programming. Um, these spaces um, and again I think that applies for number four there are the city maintains a calendar the DRA maintains a calendar so again just further coordination and ensuring that we're getting uh, maximum reach and, and completeness on those <clears throat> number five talks about beautification efforts again there are a large number of these there's some great pictures here that Don has provided of, of a number of downtown uh, installations um, I think what's needed here again based on our conversations with DRA is um, a coherent strategy, creating a theme. Um, everybody that I know of in almost the entire state of North Carolina is familiar with uh, the, the sunflowers at Dick's. They're, they're, it's, it's something that's got a unifying theme and that people uh, come and treat as, as something that's special and, and essentially attracts folks. So having better uh, thematic coordination between these different installations is something that's desired and that we want to talk about in our working group to figure out how to get that done and make a final recommendation to you in the coming months. And finally, in investing in, in, in allowing wayfinding and activations, DRA does a great job of this during special events that help uh, essentially highlight the location of businesses so that businesses can benefit from these um, downtown events. Uh, we want to expand scale that program and expand that program. And I think we, we, we think that DRA probably made the best partner to do that, but we wanna work through what would be needed on that and bring you all a specific recommendation um, on the cost and the implications of expanding that program. Um, parking rate incentives to uh, encourage and make more equitable downtown. Um, we're, we've asked our parking division to begin looking at this. Of course, that's an, uh, another impact on the parking fund, but it's certainly a potential area that would um, make you know downtown activations more successful. And finally, a special events producer, dedicated coordinator, DRA provided two really good options. I think again, in our working group, spending the time going through the pros and cons and the costs uh, and the funding sources available for those. And again, bringing that back to you in about the next 90 days or so. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you have. I have a couple of things, but I'm happy to go last if Councilmember Knight or Mayor. All right, I'll just jump in. Uh, 
Um, do you have anything? Yep. All right, go ahead. So, so my, one idea, and I think I brought this up at the last time that Bill spoke, was <clears throat> as we sort of go about reducing parking uh, requirements, capacity downtown, um, you know, we're talking about cars. Which we're talking about people that live a distance that they think they need cars. And it's this in-between uh, distance or space where I think we could do more to try to incentivize people to come, these neighborhoods around downtown. Um, and you know, we were just talking about the rickshaw idea. I think we're missing a mobility uh, space here um, that I'm you know, interested in, intrigued by, and I see it in other cities where if you live, you know, unfortunately our culture you know we think we got to drive a mile or drive a half mile when you, you really don't but be it as it may how do we get those people these neighborhoods surrounding into downtown and out of downtown without having to drive a vehicle or at least have them give them a, an option and you know they they can use the stroll away and the greenways and the other ways to you know they don't have to be on the road these these kind of vehicles uh, or these you know the rickshaw type um i guess you call them vehicles but um not powered by gasoline. Um, so how do we do that? I think there's something there that we need to think about, about how do we get people downtown uh, incentivize it uh, in ways other than, and we got the you know long-term, we got our transit plan, I, I get it, but that, I, don't, I think we're still missing a, a group of people in there um, for, for downtown. And you know, I'd love to hear, I think I've mentioned Rick Charles to you before. I think they've come and gone, they've been here before, you know, they're private. Is there something that the, that the city can do to help uh, public-private partnerships or something to get that mode of transportation um, uh, uh, active downtown especially yeah thanks for the comments I, I can't speak on, on the on the feasibility of that but it's, it's certainly a good idea and we'll take it under advisement and work with our working group to to develop the idea certainly that other communities I've worked in had you know more programmed and intentional remote parking and had then bus shuttle buses and that kind of thing which is a, a variant on what you're describing. Yeah, something that's easy, you know, relatively cheap or free. Um, and, and, you know, again, you know, somebody can just pick up the phone or real quickly have something there. They don't have to wait. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for the comments. So what you were talking about earlier with the shading, the lighting, and the PA and sound, I think that has to be a priority to um, help move forward these activations. Without it, we're just, I think we need to make that investment to secure future investment. And so if, if we don't do that, we might as well stop having this discussion right now because it's not gonna happen, in my humble opinion. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask about was the DRA model versus the third party model. Is there a preference um, or recommendation on that so so now we haven't been able to put one together in the last week since this item was was heard but we will get that back to you here shortly okay. and then um, I already mentioned the diff some of the challenges with market exchange plaza um, but what are what are the costs right now of renting the plazas um, and I I know with Union Station I think we elevated the cost. Have we kind of looked at what we're charging and whether that's fair? Whitney or Bill, could you speak to that? Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know, but I think Whitney would have that information. Whitney, you can yell from there if you want. I'm gonna look it up online really quick and then let you know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, that's what I had. I've got a couple things. Um, with the uh, beautification, I don't know what we're calling it, the murals and mm -hmm. sidewalks, crosswalks. I think there's a real opportunity there to tie that to some of the work we've been doing about telling our history and our story. Um, you know, I know that there's the installation now over on Hargett Street for the Black Main Street murals, and like, so something we could do to make those permanent. Um, and then also for LGBT history, I know that this area over here has traditionally been like the LGBT neighborhood. There were hotels that used to be here a long time ago. It was only safe places for LGBT members to go. Legends is still over here. There's a couple other establishments. I know Stonewall Sports painted with permission the sidewalk um, on the corner of, of Dawson a couple years ago. So things that we can tell our story and also make our public spaces more active 
I think that would be fantastic. Um, and then I think I may be getting ahead of the slides here, but I think it ties to the, a little bit to the technology aspect. I'm really interested in getting that LED screen for sporting events or... Mm -hmm. I was just going to say the same. I don't know if that's going to require some sort of ordinance change, but I think that has to happen. Um, we don't have a stadium downtown, and so for folks to come down and be able to watch sports and go, to go to the bars and restaurants or... I mean, we all saw what happened with the Hurricanes recently. It would have been great if we could have all been gathering for that. NC State is currently working their way through the College World Series. I'm very sorry, Councilmember Knight. Um, that we could go down and watch that. I just think that's a great way to bring people together. And it doesn't just have to be sports. There are other things that could be played on there. And so I, whatever we need to do to make that happen, I think that should be a priority as well. And every year during, every year during soccer, we get a request. Um, and there were two challenges with this. One was the permitting process, um, but the other was just, we want to all go watch, watch the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so we had multiple challenges with that, but there are tons of people, especially young people, who would be out there watching soccer and um, having a great time doing it. So, yeah. So I just want to echo one number five, the beautification effort. You know, we've all been to Chicago, Manhattan, and seen the efforts they've done, especially in Manhattan recently with our former parks director. Um, and it does have to be destination beautification, right? It's just on the streets, uh, you know, where the connections are happening, the, uh, you know, all the plantings, landscaping. I think we really got to up our game uh, to do that because it makes such a difference, I think, for people. They really, they really realize it. it's attractive and it gets people moving around and wanting to see these things. So I think not just destinations, but, but everywhere uh, where there's concrete, we need to do, uh, you know, a better job of, of, of making it uh, aesthetically pleasing. I'd Thanks. still love to see a rainbow crosswalk somewhere near Legends or one of the other LGBT establishments. That, that's just, I think whatever we can do to tie it to history, I think that would be really important. I think that's a great idea, and we'll certainly take that back to our group. Um, I've been trying to get an art crosswalk on Wilmington Street for seven years. Now is the time. So, <laughs> can you help me with that, Michael? I know, I know there are national rules and all that <laughs> stuff, you know, but what the heck. <laughs> all right, do we have anything else on this section? Okay. Great, thank you all very much. I'll turn it over. Um, Carrie, is this you or Scott? Oh, there's Scott back there. Um, turn over to Scott to talk about programming and activations. I'm going to answer the question really quick. Um, so, sorry, I just want to make sure I had the accurate numbers for you. So, Market and Exchange Plaza are both 225 per day. Um, Union Station Plaza is 500 per day and City Plaza is 750 and those were all just recently increased prior to COVID. So. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. It's actually very good to see you all in three dimensions. Likewise. Two dimensions yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> um, my portion is talking about uh, this really intriguing set of programming and activation ideas solicited during the public engagement process. Um, and they've kind of placed in three buckets here, music and performances, sports and, and sport-related gatherings, and you, you talked a little bit already about the concept of the LED screen, and then art, play, and game installations. Um, we really look forward to uh, working or engaging with this working group and the other stakeholders to see what might be possible out of this list, to see what we might be able to do. What I did want to share with you, though, is make sure you're aware of the activations and work that we already are doing. Um, there are music and performances. More Square has its lunchtime busker series back up, uh, providing music three days per week during the spring, summer, and fall. The pandemic did claim our sponsor, unfortunately, from the financially for the movies at More Square, but we are uh, searching for a new sponsor to bring that back. Uh, we actually have a conversation, uh, I think, this week with someone who may be potentially able to fund that. Who was the sponsor? Uh, Alamo Draft House. Okay. Um, uh, we do have fitness and yoga in Moore Square pr produced by uh, area providers. They come in and use the square to be able to produce. We do have our giant games that we bring out in the imagination play area every week in the square. Uh, the number of third party events is um, rentals or is, is increasing looking for to use more square space. I also don't want to make sure you're aware that our Pope House Museum and City of Raleigh Museum are now offering weekend walking tours. 
And on Sundays, the Raleigh Trolley Tour, usually which starts out of Mordecai, is now moving to uh, Moore Square on Sundays to pick up. Um, I wanted to share an opportunity that kind of falls into one of the ideas that came forward is the, the City Plaza pop-up futsal court. Uh, we're working with the Busey Foundation and the North Carolina Courage to install a temporary futsal court in City Plaza from mid-July to August. So those are kind of the activations we, we are already delivering. Um, we are intrigued with the set brought forward from that solicitation, and um, we want to see what we might be able to do within the resources we have. And I will take any questions you might have. What's futsal? It's a like type soccer. of soccer. Micro soccer. Micro soccer. Yeah. It's very popular. You can go out there when it's set up and find out. <laughs> Next, you'll have me playing pickleball. <laughs> can I we send? can do that too. <laughs> Anything? I'm good. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think before we move on to, it looks like the last slide is next steps. I'd like to just maybe turn it over to public comment. So if there's, go ahead. Yes, I, I just wanted to, to I, I don't know if Carrie wants to step up, step up to the mic. Couple things here. One was the ice rink, and that is something that Convention Center is exploring, bringing back this winter. A cost for that, so hopefully an opportunity to evaluate the federal funds for that. Also, a lot of concerts, the lunchtime Wednesday concerts are going on now in the plaza, and the Thursday night concerts at Red Hat for local bands. So Parks and Rec doing a great job, Scott, but I also wanted to share some of the things that the convention center's doing. So. Great. Do, do you want to speak for a couple minutes? or Nope, you don't have to. <laughs> okay. Is there anybody else here who'd like to talk for a couple minutes about anything we've discussed today? All right, let's move on to next steps then. <laughs> Actually, can I just, sorry. Yeah, come on up. Um, I did just want to add that Red Hat will have almost 30 concerts this season. So it's a public, it, yeah. anybody watching is not going to be able to hear you. That's okay, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you, but anyone at home is not going to. Go ahead. Painter, Raleigh Convention Center. I do want to add that the concerts at Red Hat begin um, other than this six local artist series begin July 16th, there's almost 30 this year. So, you know, that's a great opportunity to activate downtown once the national artists start coming in. Uh, they have a full season that goes to the end of October, which is longer than ever before because they're still packing a whole season in. And then the ice rink would look to be in Red Hat starting at Thanksgiving and go through January. Carrie, could you also mention right. the convention center and what you're looking at for July and through the summer and fall? Um, yeah, the convention center, um, we have uh, signed, I will say, we've signed 137 contracts in the last four weeks in our complex. So the convention center is really picking up. Uh, we have sports and dance and a lot going on right now, which was great. It provided an opportunity for those locals who couldn't get out and do any of these things to feature their children. But we began regular conventions and conferences in the fall. Um, some pretty large ones. Major League Baseball's in town this week, you may not know. They're in the center and they're in Cary playing. So as you know, that's really what activates downtown most of all is large groups of people and conferences and conventions and that keeps our hotels and heads and beds. So we are really kicking up way faster than we thought we would and so that's a real gift to us. Um, Carrie, um, when is the concert schedule for Red Hat going to be announced, the national one? It is. It's on the website now. Uh, first one's July 16th, and it goes, it's already listed. Most all of them are, but as they keep getting signed, they keep adding. And the same for Coastal Credit Union. There's, uh, I don't want to lie, 30 to 40 out there, I think. Um, there's a big season out there as well. So this made me, hearing about all the stuff coming up, hopefully we'll bring folks into town who don't live here as well, that made me think, can we get some sort of update on like the hospitality industry, the occupancy rates? I know we had several hotel projects that we were weeks away from breaking ground pre-COVID. I'm just curious you know, what the plan is. And a lot of them, I think at least two, the lots have been cleared, they're just sitting there. So if we could get some sort of update, if we're able to connect with some of the private sector and figure out what's going on, because I think that may be helpful. Sure, we're happy to work with CVB and uh, get an mm -hmm. update for council like a manager's update. That'd be fine. I was going to say, I think it would be a good work session topic. Even better. Mm -hmm. Yep. We can That'd work on that. Thank you. Thank Any, you. Anybody Thanks, else? Gary. 
Okay. Oh, yeah, here we go. Come on. Jennifer Martin, Shop Local Raleigh. So thank you for doing this. I think this is really exciting and encouraging. I'm not shy to say that I love events and love <laughs> planning them and having them. Having moved here over 11 years ago, that's actually what really? sold my husband and I on wanting to live here long term was our first Raleigh Wide Open and having a great experience with that. So we are here as a partner, um, as someone that's willing to help and do whatever we can. Um, we've worked with Bill and um, Will a lot over at DRA trying to help give ideas and input. Um, if there's anything that we can do between now and September to help, we're here. I know sometimes that 30-day barrier can be a, a, a hindrance sometimes for planning an event, but we turned around the roller skating event at the convention center. Thank you so much for letting us use your space, um, having that sold-out event there in the basement. And then last weekend, or two weekends ago, we had NC Hops Festival, a brand new event we launched over at the fairgrounds. Again, another successful event that just, um, I think people are ready to come back. It's doing it in a safe manner, in the right manner, and finding ways that they can have fun. And so we are um, completely fine and open with planning and programming as much as you guys will allow us to do. If you just come and say we need something at this date and time, we're happy to help pitch it and do it. So thank you for this. Thanks, Thank Jen. you. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to move on to next steps because I think that's a good segue because sure, I am yeah, also interested in seeing what we can do over the next, you know, we're about to go on council break. We won't have another EDI committee meeting until August, and I want to make sure that this work continues, that we have stuff ready to go in the next, in the interim. So. Absolutely. So uh, we've thrown a lot at you uh, today, and I think um, this presentation kind of gives you a sense of um, the types of items that that work group is going to be diving into and really the need for it. Um, so we'll be, to your point, uh, Chairman Milton, we'll be um, establishing really next steps. We'll be establishing that work group um, ASAP to, to really get uh, to dissecting a lot of the items that are going to require further study. Uh, there'll be uh, reviewing options. We we plan to bring some information back to this committee on the ones that uh, are, we're going to require some further discussion. So we certainly will be doing that. You know, one of the things that has um, been a hallmark of this process, certainly from from uh, DRA's uh, side, is public engagement around um, the recommendations and construction of the report. That's something that we intend to do. Uh, again, that work group is going to be comprised of staff, uh, both on the city side and DRA. But I just do want to make it clear that we do intend to engage all key stakeholders. Um, it'll be staff driven, but certainly won't. Uh, it will be very heavily informed by communications and conversations that we have with all the relevant stakeholders in this conversation. Um, of course, we are going to um, continue to support the efforts that are already underway in terms of the, a lot of those green items that you saw and even some of the yellow ones, maybe. Uh, getting those out on the street we're really not waiting on those things uh, so rest assured that um, we there are going to be some items that we're going to have to discuss further but there's a, a large segment of these recommendations that are going to be out on the street uh, you don't even have to do anything else uh, as a committee to see some of these things happening uh, we we are planning in august to bring back we're calling it a, really a progress report um, on our uh, the status of implementation. Um, so what we intend to do is to, to present to this committee all the things, the great things that have, to, uh, to my previous point, already kind of happened that are underway. Uh, and then we will also uh, talk about um, some of the issues. As we've had more time by that point, we'll bring back some of the items that require some additional conversations with you around resources, priorities, trade-off, you know, some of the things that have surfaced during the course of the conversation and presentation today. Um, and then, of course, you know, we'll be looking at quick wins. I think we, we've talked about this. A lot of the work, I think the point here is that we're going to be doing a lot of work. Um, a lot of work is already happening, and it will continue to happen. And we'll be making sure to bring in the committee as uh, as is really necessary around some of these questions. And you know, lastly, I just want to say I think you can see we had representation. I think from five or six different uh, departments. So it's um, it's a heck of a, a interdepartmental um, uh, collaboration that's helping to push these things forward. Uh, you know, there are a lot of hands in this, and I just want to uh, sort of shout out the staff. We got this report last week, and they have done yeoman's work to really do a cursory, more, even more beyond than a, more than a cursory review, but really start to dive into this report to, to get some activity. And uh, just want to That's how we that. roll, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> I see, I'm I see. sorry about that. We, got we are very team. appreciative. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> 
<laughs> we are Thank glad you to very do. Much. We're <laughs> glad to do it. And uh, well, you, it's easy to do when you've got a, a crack team like uh, like the one that that we have here at the city of Raleigh. So, uh, just want to note that and, and say, well, we're we're excited to to bring this uh, to continue work and to to continue this discussion. Uh, so, you know, Chairman Melton, if your desire is to hold this committee, uh, we can, again, we'll continue work. And we'll uh, bring back that report on, in August if you'd like. Do you need a motion for the next steps? I think we would certainly like that from you. Um, if, if you can confirm that everything you see there is, is what you'd like to have, uh, how, have us proceed. We'll report this out then, but leave the rest, like, leave it in committee. Yeah. So, um, I I'm going to make a motion based on this, but I'm going to add a couple of things just so we're, we have clarity based on what I've heard, I hope, and some of you add to it if need be. Um, but I would make a motion to approve the next steps um, for the study for um, city staff and DRA. That means forming a work group, continuing to engage um, stakeholders, um, support staff proceeding with the items identified in, um, in the public realm. Um, I wanted to put some specific emphasis, though, on the pilot program, making it not a pilot program, making it permanent and looking at fees, um, conduct regular updates to the committee, and then focus on quick wins from the study. Um, I think one of those quick wins could be the purchase of the shading, lighting, AV, and LED screen, so seeing how we can make that a priority, and then um, the grants program. Is that your motion? Yes, sir. You want a second? Okay. <laughs> Motion in a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Did you get that? Absolutely. It's Madam Clerk. Every word. Every word. All right. So um, this item overall will stay in committee. Um, we have the other item pending, which is our corner stores, also in committee. Um, so we will be reconvening in August. And thank you all so much. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Like I said last week, I'm very excited about this work and um, happy to be doing it. And if nothing else, we are adjourned. Welcome to.